Stand with us and join us as we sing To God Be the Glory. When we open God's word, what happens? God speaks. Join with us as we uh, quote this or read this scripture verse here from Hebrews chapter 4, verse 13. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Now God has spoken. He has spoken. We need to open our hearts. You know, we hear his word often and read it often, but we've got to let it penetrate and get into our hearts. So I pray that we'll all do that today. And join with us as we sing that another old hymn, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus. <clears throat> Trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know the same.
Brother Don for filling in today and we're coming to the Lord praising him and thanking him that we have a precious and dear God who loves us with an everlasting love and praise God we have praised him in song but now it's time to pray to him and maybe there's something that's impossible that's before you but nothing is impossible with our God and that's why we pray to him and ask him to do what only he can do and so it's at this time in our service where we stop and recognize God we need you we're devoted to you, but we are dependent upon you. And so if you have a burden this morning, the altar's open for any who want to come and bring their burdens and lay them before the Lord. We're asking him to help us to trust him more. And maybe we're just asking for grace to help us to help our unbelief and choose to believe that, God, you are able. We're praying this morning for several in our church family uh, that need God's healing touch. Our sister, Laura Campbell. And Susan Boyd need the healing touch of the Lord, so we want to pray for them. Also, we want to pray for Andrea Thomas and Elena Hennessy as they continue to recover. Uh, we're praying also this morning for our brother John Waugh as his son passed away this past week. And we want to pray God's comfort for John and for his entire family. And maybe you heard someone in Sunday school this morning that's facing something that's impossible and you just want to intercede for them. This is when we stop in our service and we cry out to God and we say, God, we need you. The amazing thing we learned last week is God is always near. He's not far. And he answers the cries of those who call out to him, to call out, who call out to him in truth. And so I invite you this morning, genuinely, authentically, cry out to the Lord. Bear your heart before him. He knows the situation. He knows the circumstances. And he's allowed it in our life so that we might draw near to him. So do that this morning. The altar's open for any and all who want to come and pray. You can pray there in the pew, those watching online as well. But we're going before the Lord, and he's a great and mighty God, able to do what's impossible. So offer up a prayer that reflects that today. Will you pray with me? Father in heaven, we stop today and we say thank you, Lord Jesus. You have opened up a door for us so that we can come boldly. God, that we would have grace to trust you more, to choose to believe even right now that, God, you are able to do something about which we have no power, to do something, Lord, where we're not in control, to do something, Lord, where we are out of resources, but you're not. God, help us today, Lord, to choose to believe that my God can do something. And that, Lord, your love, your goodness, your grace all reminds us to, to come, to come quickly and to ask. And to see you work in ways that only you can work. God, we pray today for healing grace, Lord. Our sisters need a healing touch. And we're thankful, Lord, you're the great healer, you're the great physician. Yes, you can use doctors. Yes, you can use medicine. But you can also speak a word, a word of comfort and healing. And Lord, you can knit their bodies back together. Lord, for our brother John, who needs to know your presence in a special way, God, his whole family. God, may you just help them to be aware that there is a shepherd that walks with them through this valley of the shadow of death. God, we pray that you would fill their hearts with precious memories, that you would flood their minds with precious memories of Tommy's life, and that, God, right now, they would, as they draw near to you, Lord, help them sense and know that you have already drawn close to them. 
God, we're here in this service today to magnify your name, to make much of Jesus, and to recognize, Lord, that as your children, we can come to you and bear our hearts and be open before you, Lord. God, today, may we do that. May we worship you authentically as the people of God, recognizing from whom we receive every good gift, from whom we receive every grace and mercy, from whom... There is only one who satisfies the hunger of our hearts, and it's you. Father, today, may our worship be pleasing to you, and may it magnify the name of your Son, our Savior, and our coming King Jesus. We ask all of this in his precious name. Amen and amen. Amen. It's good to see you again this morning in the house of the Lord here at South River Baptist Church, particularly if you chose to gather with us here in the sanctuary or if you're watching online. Now, if you are visiting this morning here in the sanctuary, if you don't mind, remain seated for a moment and allow our church family to welcome you into the house. Lord, we do that by having all of our South River family stand at this time, brothers and sisters. I'm going to ask you to do that right now. Say hello to your brother and sister. Tell them it's good to see them in the house, Lord. But if you see a guest seated around you, please make them feel welcome in God's house this morning. Okay, let's gather back around. Is my mic on? I'm not going to tell you again. song hard to just start be that jack go ahead be thou my vision
this morning. Father, we give thanks today that you are our vision, Lord. You are our great reward. Lord, you're our inheritance. You're all we need. And it's in times such as this, Lord, in our service where we stop and recognize that you give us every good gift. You shower them into our lives. And Lord, we are just called to steward them faithfully. Thank you, Father, that by faith we realize we do more with less. And so we give back to you joyfully, cheerfully today. Because we recognize that with you, little is much. You are a great multiplier. So take our offerings today, Lord, and may you use them to advance your kingdom, to make your glory known, Lord. Lord, we give in a way today, Lord, which says we love you more than stuff. And so, Lord, may you be pleased by what we present to you today. We ask your favor and blessing upon it in Jesus' precious name. Amen.
to you. the Lord. Thank you, ladies, for reminding us our journey of faith, this race we run, we run it with our eyes fixed on Jesus. He's the author and the perfecter of our faith. And children, you're running off to Children's Church to turn your eyes to God's Word and hear Him speak. And may God reveal Himself in His Word today as Pastor Bradley teaches you the Word of God. And we're in the book of Hebrews this morning. He's really excited to get there. Amen. I haven't seen any of you walking, running across the parking lot to get in this morning, as eager as he is. Amen. Take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Hebrews, chapter 4, as you're turning there. We are studying God's attributes, and hopefully as we're going through these attributes, learning about our God, hopefully our understanding of God is increasing, our vision of who he is is increasing. Now, we have a great and awesome God and because of who he is, we understand who we are and how we should live. And we should live with bold faith because there's no one like our God. He's the God can do impossible things and he wants us to realize that. And as we've learned that he's wholly other, he's not like us. He's so transcendent and higher than us, but he's also imminent among us. Today we turn to the beginning of three attributes that are really co-related. They, they're interrelated in so many ways. They all begin with the word omni which means all, and they are the omnipresence of God, the omniscience of God, and the omnipotence of God. And what that means is God uh, is present everywhere in all places. We'll look at that one next week. God has all power. We'll see that one in two weeks. But today we want to consider God's omniscience, which means God knows all things. God has all knowledge. He's not limited in any way. In all places, He he knows all things, and he has all the power when he's in all these places. Now, the author of Hebrews, Paul, writes for us today this one verse, verse 13. We read it already. We spoke it out loud. And I'm going to try to preach it from the context of the chapter and of the book, and also in the context of the Word of God. Uh, but if I wanted to meditate on all three of those attributes, his omniscience, his omnipresence, and his omnipotence, you could sing Psalm 139. You could meditate on that as they're interrelated there. And I'll allow you to do that during the week because David writes a beautiful song. We'll highlight some of it today about God's omniscience. Uh, but our God is an amazing God worthy of praise. And, and we should stand in awe of him when we consider these things. But the author of Hebrews is writing right here about those who knew a little bit about God and knew some of his promises, but they failed to experience the blessing, the rest that God had intended for them. And the reason that happened is because they lacked faith. They didn't trust God and they didn't obey God. And because of their lack of obedience, because of their lack of faith, Paul writes, listen, we don't want to be like them. We want to enter into the rest that God has promised. Joshua, of course, led that second generation into the promised land. The first generation missed out because of their lack of faith. But when Joshua brought the second generation in, even they didn't experience the full rest that God had intended for his people. They only had an earthly rest. There still awaits a rest for us. It's a heavenly rest. And I don't know about you, but I'm looking forward to it. Amen? Now, the way you get to that heavenly rest is by resting in what Christ has done for us. And because Jesus has achieved our redemption, because Jesus has accomplished all that's required to get into that heavenly rest, you and I can rest from our labors to try to make ourselves good enough with God, righteous enough, and we can, by repentance and faith, put our trust in his sacrifice that he has offered for us. And by that, we are able to enter into that rest. But Paul is warning Listen, Paul is warning us as he warned these Hebrews when he wrote to them. He's writing and saying, listen, be careful. Because there is a promise that remains of entering into his rest. But we, we don't want to be like any of them that fell short of it. Uh, we want to run the race all the way to the tape. Amen? We want to reach the golden shore. 
And, and, and in life, there's some hardships and difficulties that we face. There's some difficult things, some difficult terrain that we might experience, some valleys we might walk through, some mountaintops. Praise the Lord for those. But here's the amazing thing. God, from the foundation of the world, knew everything that they would experience with Moses, everything those believers would experience with Joshua, everything you and I would experience as well. Before God made anything, he knew the beginning to the end. Amazing. He knows all things. He has known everything that has happened in his created order. And it only makes sense because we've already discovered God is infinite. Being infinite means he does not have any boundaries. There is no boundary to his knowledge. And I want you to see with me how Paul exposes that to you and to me today. And as he does that, he's exposing us to the truth and the word of God. And by that, you have to make a decision. I have to make a decision. When I stop and I realize God knows everything about me. Now listen, I know, I know we need to hear this. Because it's easy to simply hit delete and think no one will know my history. I know it's easy to put a veneer over something that's rotted out in the house and think no one will know what's behind that wall. I know it's easy for us to, to hide things or think we can throw things in the depths of a deep lake and think no one will know God knows. And we need to hear this today. Why? So that you and I can be authentic and not run from God but run to Him. And run to him and discover, if he already knows, why not come out into the open and be honest? Come into the light. And allow him, as he exposes it, to run to him and experience mercy and grace. You see, that's what Paul's going to teach us today. How you and I can find rest, listen, with the God who knows everything about us. Won't you stand with me and honor the word of the Lord? I'm going to start reading in verse 11 and go to the end of the chapter in Hebrews chapter 4. I'll focus primarily on chapter 13, verse 13 through verse 16 today. But listen to what Paul writes. Let us therefore be diligent to enter the, that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. For the word of God is living and powerful, sharper than a two-edged, any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there's no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account, seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Father, may we be honest with you today that we are needy. God, we need a lot of things. And most importantly, we need you. God, I pray that as you reveal your truth to us today about who you are and the truth about who we are, God, may we embrace such knowledge and may it transform our lives, God. May our thoughts and the intent of our heart, God, May it be authentic and genuine and true. And God, even as you reveal things, Lord, may we realize that it's not worth trying to hide any longer. But we need to come to Jesus while there's time. We love you. And we praise you. And we ask all this in his precious and powerful name. Amen. And amen. You may be seated. How can we find rest with the God who knows us completely? God is omniscient. He possesses perfect knowledge of himself he's the only one who knows himself thoroughly no man can know the mind of God no one can know everything about God but himself but he also knows everything perfectly about his creation and all the created beings that are in it anything everything that is possible and actual God knows all of those things for all times past present and future 
God's knowledge isn't like your knowledge and my knowledge. When we were born and, and we were growing up as little ones, we were growing and, and learning and discovering things. God's never discovering anything. God knows all things. When we get older, I don't know about you, but sometimes I think, I forgot what I know. I need to be reminded. God never has that problem. He has perfect knowledge. He remembers and knows all things in the past. In fact, there's sometimes in my life when I look back and I say, man, I just wish I had known that I would have made a different decision. Ever been there? God never has. God never has been like, oh, if I just had that little tidbit of information, I would have made this decision instead. There's no discovering with God. There's no learning with God. He's not just one step ahead of us, as an open theist would say. No, God knows all things at all times perfectly and he's never surprised by something that happens he has infinite knowledge and Isaiah would say in Isaiah 40 28 his understanding is unsearchable but what God does search out is you and me not because he doesn't know but so that you and I will come to know and that be through that we will have a change of mind and that we will experience repentance and turn to Him. God is searching us, knowing us. And God doesn't depend on you and I to know something. He just knows everything that is. Now for some, when you realize God knows everything about me and everything about my path in life and everything that's transpiring in my life, for some people when that happens, they run from God because they're scared of what is going to be revealed. But what God wants us to do is run to Him, not from Him. And it's important, as, the, as, as Paul writes here, to understand this, that God knows all of our pathways. God's Word speaks. God is revealed and exposed things. The nature of the Word is illuminate, illuminating things. It's a lamp. It's a light. God's Word is always exposing things and revealing things. And we come to a God as He exposes these things, even the Word of God that's alive and it's living and it's sharper than a two-edged sword. It, it exposes us. It reveals who we truly are on the inside, our thoughts and the intents of our heart. And verse 13 tells us that there's no creature hidden from his sight. You see, God's knowledge doesn't inform him. He just knows. He knows everything perfectly. And his presence in all places enables him to know all things at all times. And the eyes of the Lord, as the, as the Proverbs would say in Proverbs 15, are in every place keeping watch over the evil and the good. And no creature can escape that. David writes about it in Psalm 139 this way. He says, God, you have searched me and known me. I look back in my life, and God, you've seen me through and through. Nothing's been hidden from you. You've known when I've sat down. You know when I rise up. You know when I walk in the way. You know everywhere that I go, God knows what you and I are doing. Before you chose your pew today, God knew it. Before you chose to, to get up and, and, and leave and go where you're going to go to lunch today, God already knows where that will be. He'll know what you'll order. He knows, listen, the conversations that you and I have already had, the words that we have already spoken. David would say, listen, even before a word is formed on my tongue, God knows it. God knows what I'm going to say in the next two minutes, three minutes, five minutes, five years, ten years. If I'm still on this earth, 50 years. God knows all of those things. He knows it all. In fact, he doesn't just know what I'm thinking about saying and what I actually say. He knows what I possibly could have said and could have possibly done. God knows all things. And the amazing thing is, David says, he knows what I'm thinking. He knows us inside and out. Why? Because he made us inside and out. As David would say there in Psalm 139, it, 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 he fearfully and wonderfully wove us together. He knows your frame. He knows everything about you and everything about me. Or as, the, as Jesus would say, he knows all the hairs on our head. The gray ones and the ones that are falling out. Amazing. In fact, he knows all things, all events, all possibilities. Even when a sparrow falls to the ground, he's mindful of that. He knows all of those things. David would say it this way. In fact, God knows your past, present, and future. Why? Because when he fearfully and, wove and wonderfully made you and me and wove us together, he wrote in a book all the days for us even before there hadn't been one yet. 
God has already written down, listen, your days on this earth, my days on this earth. And unless Jesus returns quickly, we will live all of those days that God has intended. And not one less and not one more, but those days. Now for David, when he heard that, when he contemplated that, when he thought about the infinite knowledge of God in those ways, he said, man, this is precious. This is awesome. Uh, this is a, a, incredible to stop and to think about. Such knowledge is wonderful for me. And it can be wonderful for you and me too as his children. When we realize our God is mindful of everything that is happening in our lives. And he knows about it even before we experience it. I can walk by faith trusting him and resting in him. And realizing that my God is aware of everything. But for some, they say, oh no, I'm exposed. I'm revealed. No creature is hidden from his sight. Everything is laid naked and bare. You see, it's interesting as this chapter talks about rest, and here it highlights that no creature is, is not seen, every, everything is not hidden, God is aware, everyone is laid bare and laid open. When you stop and think about what happened with Adam and Eve in the garden, when they were experiencing the shalom, the rest of God, and through disobedience and sin, they lost that, and when they were exposed and revealed to one another and realized we're naked, what did they do? They ran to the trees to hide. God came walking in the garden and he said, Adam, where are you? That wasn't because God didn't know. What was it? It was God's invitation for Adam to repent, to acknowledge what God already knew, to turn to him and to acknowledge what was real, what was real about the situation. And as Adam hid there and he was hiding, he said, uh, uh, we got a problem, the woman that you gave me. And the woman said, it's the serpent's fault. You see, that's what happens sometimes when we're exposed. We think we can run and we can hide, we can cover it up. And the reality is you may, I may be able to do that with others around us, but we can never do it with God. No creature is, lay, it, no creature is hidden from his sight. All things are naked and bare to him. Literally, this is the only use of the New Testament word that's used here to, to talk about this exposure that's taken place. But here's the picture. Imagine a wrestler. If you're a wrestler, I wrestled when I was in, well, from actually 35 pounds all the way to massive Herculean 91 pounds. And, um, and, uh, and, and I graduated when I went to high school and and, uh, and we were really good. And I loved throwing guys in headlocks and having a good time. And my favorite part was putting them in the headlock. And as I have them down there on the mat, just smiling at them, just I'm turning their head. And I always like to say this to them sweetly, count the lights, right? As you look up and you're being pinned. That's the picture in the Greek what's happening here. You and I often act like brute beasts. And we look down at the ground because we don't want to acknowledge him. And what he's trying to do with the word, with the word that exposes us, listen, it cuts through. It, it divides soul and spirit, bone and marrow. It, it's a discerner of your thoughts and your hearts. Just God's word, when you and I truly read it and our hearts really open before it, what God is doing is he's trying to get us in a, he's trying to say, will you stop being stubborn and will you look up at the lights? And will you acknowledge what I already know? He doesn't want us to wrestle like that. He'd rather we just come freely and run to him and acknowledge what he already knows. I mean, we really can't fool him. Why are we trying? It's better to be honest. By the way, children, I often remind my, my, my children, my sons and daughters of this. When I ask a question of you, I already know the answer. I'm actually giving you an invitation to be honest with me. And that's what God does with his children. He wants us to run to him, to be honest with him, to acknowledge what he already knows. No creature is hidden from his sight. His eyes see it all. Why would we think we can pull the wool over his eyes? We can't. But we're naked, we're, 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 naked, we're laid bare, we're, we're open to the eyes of him who, to whom we must give an account. You see, this is the gravity of the situation. This this passage is saying to you and I that, that we're exposed and one day we are going to be judged. We have to give an account of who we are 
and what we've done and what we've said and where we've gone and the things that we've done. Why not run to him now and acknowledge what he already knows? Those who try to hide one day will be brought before the bar of justice. Everyone will be judged, the great and the small, at the great white throne judgment. But for believers, we can avoid that judgment. There's no mercy there. There's only judgment. But we can run to him now and experience mercy. And acknowledge, you already know, why should I try to hide it from you? You know, David, even a man who loved God, tried to hide what he did. Tried to cover up his sin and, and, and did everything he could to manipulate the circumstances, make it appear he hadn't done anything. But the prophet came and stuck his finger right in the king's eyes and said, you're the man, you did this. And God revealed it. Why? Why? So that David would come to realize God knows. And so that David didn't continue to live in sin. To turn to him. You see, God is fully aware of our paths in life. He sees it all. He knows it all. No creature, no one is hidden from his sight. There's some who say, I'm not going to church. You know why? It's guilt. They're exposed and they know it. And they don't want to acknowledge it. And yet by acknowledging it, that's how their life can be made new. That's how they can experience newness of life. Because see, God knows. God knows everything that is happening. In fact, it's fascinating to me when you stop and think about this. If we're going to run the race of faith, why not run it knowing He already knows? He knows what I'm going to go through. He knows the trials. He knows the temptations. He knows when I'm going to stumble and fall even. He knows that. He also knows when I'm going to get back up and keep going and choose to live by faith. Run that race. Be aware. Nothing's hidden. That's why the word speaks. It illumines. It exposes. It reveals. It shows us who God is and it shows us who we are. Be honest with yourself and be honest with God, and life can be changed. Notice how this happens. Seeing then that we have, verse 14, a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession, for we don't have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. You see, God knows my path, And God knows the difficulties and hardships along that path and the weaknesses and the pain and the things that we experience from the problems in life. And I have a choice when I run that race. I can hold fast to my confession that God is who he says he is and he has a promise that he wants me to experience, a rest that he wants me to experience. And I can achieve that and realize that, but I've got to run that race looking at that high priest who's interceding for me. You have to run that race looking to that high priest. Now listen, this high priest is not like any other. This high priest, as Paul would say later in the book of Hebrews, he's not like the other earthly high priests. They sinned. They had to offer a sacrifice for their sin before they offered the the sacrifice on Yom Kippur for the sins of God's people. Jesus didn't have to do that. Praise the Lord. He, he's a high priest, listen, who didn't enter into the, the courtyard and into the door of the temple and, and even enter into the veil just temporarily for one day, for a moment, so he could throw some blood on the mercy seat and plead for the mercy of God and then exit that holy of holies. Jesus passed through to the heavens. He is there at the right hand of the Father. He presented the sacrifice that was acceptable for all time, once for all time. The perfect sacrifice. Not as the high priests on earth have to do every year offering a sacrifice for the remission of sins. Could the blood of bulls and goats really take away the sins of mankind? No. But Jesus offered the sacrifice and he passed through there to the heavenlies. And now he's our great high priest. He's at the right hand of the Father. He sat down because his work is finished. So let us hold to that confession and let's draw near because, listen, he understands us. He he sympathizes with our weaknesses. Why? We could see he stepped down off that throne and stepped into his created order and put this stuff called flesh on and walked on this earth. And he understands the things that we go through in life. And he can sympathize with us. 
He was tempted as we are, yet without sin. He, t- he was tempted. He experienced the, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. All those categories of sin, just like you and I did. Yet he never sinned. He understands this. He understands these things. He understands the nature of temptation. He understands desperation. He understands, listen, when you're in desperate need. He, I mean, because everywhere he went, foxes had holes and birds had nests. But the Son of Man had nowhere to lay his head to rest. He understands need. He understands these things because he walked among us. He does understand us. He understands our pain when you have hurt in life. He shed tears just as you and I would. He he, he understands what it means to lose someone who's near to him. He did. He shed tears when Lazarus died. He understands, listen, total desperation, sorrow, and grief. He understands heartbreak. Why? Because he took on full flesh. He had full humanity and understands these things. And so when you and I are weak, when we experience our trials, when we experience temptations, when we experience our tears, we can run to one who understands what we're going through and talk to him. Now here's the even greater thing. He knows that situation we're in. He knows he has allowed that situation in your life and my life. He knows these things. And why, listen, why then does he just not fix it right away? He is maturing your faith and my faith. He is proving the genuineness of our faith. He is producing in us perseverance and character and hope as we walk through these trials. When you and I come through those things, it's best to say, God, I don't know what's happening. And it'd be easy for me to be anxious because I don't know. But I choose to believe and I choose to trust. You know, you know all these things. Well, he knows something you and I don't even know. And that is rejection in a way that we'll never know. Because you see, when he died on the cross, it wasn't just that the disciples left him. In a moment when he took the sin of the world and bore that sin as the sin offering that was the substitute God was offering for you and for me. In a moment of desperation, he cried out, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which is my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? A child of God will never experience that because we have a faithful father. And he experienced that so we never would have to. It's amazing. And he knows what we are going through. Now, if he knows all that, he knows our path, he knows our pain, he knows all the circumstances that are going on, you and I have to make a choice. Why run from him? Run to him. And yet, that should be the first thing we do, and often it's the last thing we do. What God says, just come acknowledge to me what I already know. See, part of that is enabling you and I, listen, to make sense of the world that we're in, or somewhat, somehow. And sometimes we have to trust Him with those circumstances, even when we can't make sense of it. And He's inviting us as a high priest interceding for us to draw near. Now, why would I draw near? Now, notice what He says. He's got the solution. He's got the solution to your problem and my problem. Look look at verse 16. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain two things, mercy... And find grace to help in time of need. Why, listen, if I, God knows everything, why doesn't he just give it? We run to him and acknowledge, God, you already know this, but I'm going to ask. And I need. Yours is the throne of grace. And I come boldly. We can come boldly. Why? Because of what Christ has done for us. And we come to a throne of grace, of a gracious God. Now what's fascinating is, is he gives mercy and grace. Why would I need mercy? Because you see, sometimes the things that have happened in my life are the result of my sin, my choices, my actions. And because of that, I need mercy. And I'm grateful God forgives. Amen? And He gives that freely because of what Christ did at Calvary. When He shed His blood and paid the penalty that sin deserves, all sin, He paid that penalty because the wages of sin is death. Christ died for us. And offered himself in that sacrifice. So we can obtain mercy. And praise God, those mercies come every day, fresh and new. But also, 
Sometimes the decisions of others, maybe even sinful decisions of others, affect us, and I find myself in need. I need assistance. I didn't make the choice. Someone else did. It's a circumstance beyond my control. I didn't do anything, but I find myself in need of grace. And the amazing thing is, we can find it with the one who is gracious. Now put those two things together. This is the nature of our God. And man, I am so grateful he is gracious. Because what he does is he gives. And the greatest given he gives is forgiving. Mercy and grace. And you can come boldly at any time of any day, at any situation, any circumstance. The ones you don't have any control of, but he has complete control of. And you and I can come and say, God, it's me again. It's healthy, by the way. To acknowledge that. Man, he loves that, y'all. You know, as a daddy, I love when my kids say, Dad, I need some help. Even when they get older. Right? I mean, I want my sons to be men. To handle it, to tackle it, to go for it. But it's wrong to think I can be self-sufficient and handle it on my own. It's wrong for them to think that, too. I love when they come and ask me, Hey, Dad, can you help? Yeah, let me help. My little girl, especially. Blue eyes and all. Yeah. Come help. You see, our Father, come, come. He's a good Father. He's gracious. Why not run to Him? I mean, do you think you... You know what I love about the Psalms? There, I mean, there's so many beautiful Psalms. But, but in one Psalm, in Psalm 86, it says this. For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will He withhold from them that walk uprightly. Listen, God will not deprive His children when we come to Him in integrity, rightly, and we come before Him honestly, and we say, I need help. I need help. It's the nature of our God. You see, what Satan has done in the destruction of homes is he's destroyed the image of the Father in so many people's minds that people don't run to the Father for help. But He's good. Why wouldn't we? He's always good. We haven't even got to omnibenevolent, always good. But, oh, I'm so glad that he is. And the invitation is always just taste and see for yourself that God is good, gracious. I mean, his throne is a throne of grace. We can obtain mercy. We can find grace to help us in times of need. You try and navigate life, oh, I don't need it. I got it. Oh, my, that's not a good place to be. I need thee every hour is what the great hymn writer wrote, right? Lord, I need thee. Oh, I need thee. Grateful he's there. He's never sleeping. He's never, oh, excuse me, take a number. He's not like that, amen? He's available. In fact, at the end of the service, when I give an invitation, here's the opportunity. You and I have heard him speak, and now we listen, lest we miss out on the promise of what he has for us, lest we disobey or we lack faith and don't want to trust him and take him at his word. That's the time when you and I respond. I've heard you speak, and now I want my life to be changed, God. It isn't just I need something. I need you. The nearness of my God is my good. You are what I need. And we come. That's why the altar's open. It's why it's an invitation for you to say, I heard God speak, and the Spirit said to me, this is something I need to deal with in my life. Now today, if God explains, exposes us, listen, realize this, when God is exposing us, that two-edged sword, listen, that's not a broadsword to slay you and cut you down. That's not what he wants to do. Have in your mind this picture, it is a scalpel, and what he wants to do, the divine physician, is he wants to cut away something in your life, something in my life that is sin, that is a hindrance, that's a lack of faith. It's something that needs to be removed in your life and my life so that the healing salve can be applied in your life and we can be changed and made new. And our lives can be radically different than they were the moment you and I walked in the doors today. We can walk out different because you know what? God spoke. And I heard him speak. And his spirit applied that word to my heart. And now I've turned from self. I've turned from a sin. I've turned in a situation where I desperately need him. And I've cried out, God, I need you. The, the choir sang beautifully this morning. Man, our God does the impossible. God does it. And you know what it requires of you and me? This little mustard seed thing called faith. Just a little mustard seed. That's all it requires. That mustard seed has the power to move mountains. 
That mustard seed has the power to bring healing, comfort, strength, anything we have need of when we run to him. When we run to him authentically, genuinely. God, it's me. Here I am. I, I know some, listen, there's some, you've been kneeling beside your bed crying out to God. Don't stop. Keep running to him. He knows, but he hasn't done anything about the situation, Pastor Chris. He's at work in ways you and I can't see. He knows everything that's going on. He knows what could happen, all the potential possibilities. He knows what will happen. And this is the sweet assurance for the believer that our God is working all things together for good and for his glory. To those who love and who call according to his purpose, that's the promises we have. He will be glorified in this earth, and he will assure for you and for me goodness. If not on this earth, then ultimately. And so, like David, when you realize these things, God, you've searched me and you've known me. David contemplates all of that, and when he gets down to the end of that psalm, you know what he says? God, keep searching me. Keep knowing me. Don't stop. In fact, Try me. See if there's any anxious way in me. What is anxious? What's an anxious way? That's when we don't know. I mean, don't you get anxious when you don't know? I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what they're going to decide. I don't know what the outcome's going to be. We worship a God. We love a God. We serve a God. Listen, who does know? Praise God I can rest in Him. Man, praise God I can rest in Him. Run to Him. God, keep searching me. Keep knowing. Keep trying me. Lord, if there's any wicked way in me, expose that so I can repent and turn away from it. And then David would say, lead me in the way everlasting. I want the right paths, the true paths, the, the, the righteous. Hey, by the way, they're really narrow, especially in this world, right? God knows. Don't, don't, don't treat him like a fool. He knows. Don't try to pull the wool over his eyes. He knows. Be honest with him. He wants you, he wants me to be genuine right here. That's the kind of worshipers he's after, those who worship him in spirit and in truth. Maybe you see you get on the altar this morning. There's an impossible situation, and it's not from your making. It's just something that's happened. you have no control over. God knows. Why don't you just talk to him about it? Say, God, I'm going to leave this with you today. I'm tired of carrying it. It's kind of heavy. And I'm going to choose to trust you. Maybe there's a situation that is of your choosing. And God knows what the outcome will be. You don't. I don't. But he does. Why not come and say, God, I know you have the power to work all these things in this situation for good and for your glory. Will you do that, Lord? Maybe you just need to intercede for someone today. This is the time. Listen, if we've heard him speak, there's plenty of time to respond right now. In other words, listen, to respond so that your life and my life is different when we walk out the doors of the church today and we're made new. And part of that is because of what we now know about God, and that is God knows everything. So let's stop hiding. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. And the opportunity is now, if you need to trust in Jesus, there's a problem, a situation. If you need to put your faith and rest in Him, He'll never fail you. Come run to Him. Come bring your burden to Jesus. Come bring your uncertainty, that which you don't know, bring it to Jesus. Come choose today to believe that there's a God who knows everything that's going on. By the way, it may be a situation that you're not aware of. All the motives of people and everything of why they're doing what they're doing. But you realize today, Jesus, you know.